Hello everyone, welcome back to the podcast. This is part three of the Primal City series that I started back in March. I was hoping to get all four parts out one after the other, um, but as I started researching this episode, which is all about biophilia, um, I just kept finding more and more interesting stuff to read and more and more sources and different angles to take on it. Um, so I've ended up just basically <laughs> spending way too much time uh, reading and writing for this episode. Um, and I thought it's it's even though it still feels unfinished, there's still so much more to explore in this topic. I'm just going to get it out, <laughs> and I might provide an update later down the line um, if I feel like I need to. I guess in a sense these episodes are always a bit unfinished um, because they're just a snapshot of whatever research I've managed to do and whatever thoughts I'm having on this at the time. You'll notice I have uh, you're not hearing the normal background music. Um, in today's episode, I'm going to be bringing in uh, nature sounds underneath the episode uh, because of the topic that we're talking about. I want to talk about biophilia and ecology, and in a sense, about recreating our natural habitat in towns and cities. The concept of biophilia is really about how we as humans have an innate love and connection to other living things. It's no surprise then that spending time in natural environments, such as forests, mountains, even urban parks, is extremely beneficial to our mental and physical health. There's lots of research behind this. Rob Hopkins provides a nice summary in his book, From What Is to What If? He writes, A large body of research shows the health benefits of contact with nature. These include reduced stress, better sleep, improved mental health, including reduced depression and anxiety, greater happiness, well-being, life satisfaction, reduced aggression, improved child development, lower blood pressure, better eyesight, and improved immune function. Hopkins also argues that contact with nature is essential for the cultivation of our imaginations, that time in nature allows the mind to relax sufficiently to be open to new ideas and imagine new ways of living, which is something we sorely need in this day and age. For those of you who are new to the concept or want more of an explanation of of biophilia, I suggest you listen to episode 7 of the podcast with Niall McAvoy, and I'm also very excited that in a few weeks I will be recording an episode with Vanessa Champion, who is editor of the Journal of Biophilic Design, who also has a great podcast by the same name. So there's lots of resources out there about this. Consider that the human species has spent 300,000 years as a foraging species embedded within ecosystems. Also considering the fact that there are still foraging bands and hunter-gatherers existing in the world today. Some of our ancestors, then about 10,000 years ago, uh, adopted agriculture and moved to more of an agricultural lifestyle. Started living in a more altered environment, but still one that was very close to other living beings. We have now spent only the last 15 years as a predominantly urban species, when in 2007, the number of people living in towns and cities reached over 50% of the global population. Those of us who live in cities can easily forget how unnatural it is for us human animals, and how we have not had nearly enough time to adapt to urban environments. The noise, air pollution, unnatural materials like concrete, and most of all the lack of other living beings, biodiversity, results in an unhealthy environment that is foreign to us as animals. Think back to the last time you were in a fully natural environment. Maybe it was a walk through a forest, a hike up a mountain, or watching the sunset on a beach. We all know that amazing sense of calm and well-being it provides us. And we do our best to take those moments of calm and restoration with us back into our busy urban lives. The thing is, that's how you're meant to feel all the time. Those special moments should be ordinary, punctuated by moments of stress and high intensity, not the other way around. Although we like to think we live in the healthiest period in history, having the best health care and a long life expectancy, we are actually globally in declining health. Rates of depression, anxiety, obesity, malnutrition, and a vast array of other mental and physical diseases have been rising steeply over the past 30 years, 
We could try to address each of these individually, for instance by developing new and better drugs. But the fact that we're facing epidemics of so many health issues at once means we could be said to be living in a syndemic. A syndemic is a synergistic epidemic, where multiple epidemics co-occur together in the same time and place and share common societal drivers. That means we need to look at the entire burden of disease together and figure out the underlying systemic drivers. I'm not so naive to think that spending more time in nature will solve all of our health problems alone. But once we take an evolutionary perspective, it is clear that most of us are living in an environment, both physically and culturally, that is not suited to us, and therefore recreating a version of that natural habitat for Homo sapiens should have a positive impact on our health. You may remember in episode one, I mentioned this idea um, that I read in the book Civilized to Death by Dr. Christopher Ryan, that in a sense, human beings are the only species that create our own zoo. And he uses the example of comparing uh, basically a a terrible zoo that he visited once where the animals were all sick and they weren't given the right food and they weren't in the right environment compared to a really good zoo, which I think was in San Francisco, uh, where the uh, zoologists had actually designed it to mimic the species natural environment as best as possible. And although it's still not the same thing, the animals were much healthier uh, and had much better well-being. Well, the same thing applies to us. Some of our cities and towns are just so far removed from our natural habitat, it's no wonder that we are facing uh, health and well-being issues. Um, And something we can do to change that is perhaps to design our cities, our our urban environments, our human zoos, to be more similar to our natural habitat, which is what I'm talking about today. Now, this idea that connection with nature and well-being is, is, is fundamentally connected Um, is backed up by literally hundreds of studies. You may have heard about studies where they show that after spending time in a park, people are more relaxed, happier, and even more creative and productive at work. Often the advice that flows from this is that we need to ensure our cities have a large number of public green spaces within walking distance of residents. This is obviously great advice, and many places have a lot of work to do to meet this standard. However, if we are considering our evolutionary past, Maybe this approach doesn't go far enough. The idea of proximity to public parks is a form of dualism. It says that humans live in an artificial, man-made environment, and we have to go and visit nature, which we keep in designated areas. I propose that we need to break down this distinction. However, at this point, it's worth pointing out that although the topic is well-researched, the research hasn't been very representative. A recent academic paper reviewed 174 research papers on the nature and well-being connection and found that participants involved were overwhelmingly white and in wealthy countries. Rachel Gould of the University of Vermont, one of the researchers of the review paper, says, There's nothing necessarily wrong with the existing findings. Those findings are important, but we have but we have reason to believe that they may not apply to the entire population. In order to allow this work to influence sustainability action and to move us towards sustainability, we need to know which of the effects are universal and which are culturally specific. This is actually a larger problem within academic research in the Global North, which mainly studies people who are WEIRD, which is an acronym for Western, Educated, Industrialized, Rich and Democratic. And indeed, many many people who are studied um, in uh, these kind of big Uh, Research studies also tend to be uh, university students because they're the people who are on hand and have the time to to contribute. And so we tend to study this very specific group of people and then try and draw conclusions about all, all human beings everywhere. Also consider that just because a park exists doesn't mean that all members of society are able or feel comfortable to use it. There's been a number of research projects in the UK over the years that consistently found that people who are white, wealthier and better educated have better access and make much more use of public green spaces compared to people from minority ethnic backgrounds or those who have lower incomes or education levels and even those who have a disability or long-term illness. The UK charity Groundwork released a report in 2021 with similar findings calling for the role of parks and green slash blue spaces in urban areas to be reimagined 
putting communities and local people at the forefront of decision making when it comes to their design and management. This will help efforts to level up local economies, improve the physical and mental health and well-being of those suffering greatest health inequalities, as well as tackling climate change and supporting nature recovery. Research by Dr Bridget Snaith at the University of East London found that different ethnic groups had different preferences for landscape design styles, which may affect their use of certain spaces. Seeing as 95% of landscape architects in the UK are white, it begs the question of whether our parks are white by design, unconsciously or consciously excluding large parts of the population. In fact, this is a wider issue within built environment professionals. Architects, planners, urban designers and engineers are also overwhelmingly white and unrepresentative of the wider population. This is a good reminder for me that when I'm talking about the urban design of cities and how it needs to change, I need to be mindful that my tastes and perspective is not the only is not representative of the wider public. And so any changes to local neighborhoods needs to be meaningfully co-created with that community. So let's explore some ways of making our cities more ecological and more human, bearing in mind that how that looks will vary depending on the place. I'd also like to make clear that in this next section, I'm very much talking about European cities, which are what I'm most familiar with. Uh, with and is m- what's most relevant to me. I'm sure the principles for cities in desert, tropical or arctic conditions would be different. I've been thinking that there might be three levels of depth to our way of thinking about biophilia in towns and cities. At the most superficial level, we might say we need more green and use words like green infrastructure and urban greening. I am guilty of these abstract superficial terms too. Although well-meaning and on the right track, this approach ultimately stems from plant blindness, our lack of knowledge about plants, their roles and needs. We look out at a forest or a public park and say, wow, look at all that green, without any inkling of the complexity and diversity at play. If we start from this point, we risk investing time and money in urban greening projects, ha, there's that word again, that are ultimately lacklustre, prone to failure, or are culturally and ecologically inappropriate for their location. One step better is to recognise that we should prioritise planting native plants, or to specify plants in our designs that fulfil a certain purpose, such as pollination, water purification, or trapping air pollution. Certainly this should give us better results, but this is still a human-centric and individualistic mindset which sees all plants as singular things that we can deploy to fulfil a service for humans. I've spoken with a number of previous guests about, for instance, the way trees interact and communicate with each other, sharing information, water and nutrients through the roots and even through chemicals in the air. But really, no individual species exists in isolation, although we humans have been trying our best to do just that. In an intact ecosystem, a wide diversity of plant and animal species coexist, compete and collaborate together, creating an overall healthy environment for all. In other words, it's a system. There are individual components, but together they create a wider system behaviour. When we pick one of these species out and plant them in a concrete box on the side of a busy road, the plant may grow, but it's no longer part of that thriving, healthy system. What we need in cities is to create the conditions for these ecosystems to thrive. That will take more than a small number of individual plants, isolated from one another, in planters. Plants are the foundation of an ecosystem, but they also need something. Soil. Look out across a cityscape and it is clear that we have way too much hard surfacing to allow for the interconnected subsoil ecosystems to flourish. What is driving this need for impermeable hard surfaces, it's largely transportation and storage infrastructure for cars. Roads and car parks cut across our cities, separating ecosystems and creating dangerous conditions for urban wildlife. It seems obvious that a reduction in car ownership and use and a move towards lighter, smaller and more efficient transport systems should be an opportunity to rewild our cities, bringing birdsong, the rustle of leaves and the smell of herbs to every street. Another risk of a lack of plant diversity is that the plants we ignore are at risk of extinction. 
A recent study from the Smithsonian Institute analyzed 85,000 plant species and found that about half of these could be categorized as losers or potentially losers of the Anthropocene because they are not deemed useful or important to humans and therefore their numbers are dwindling. The winners are largely those plants we cultivate for crops or for materials. A Guardian article reporting on the study reads, The results suggest that in the future there will be a lot less biodiversity, which in turn will drive a loss of animal diversity and make ecosystems even more vulnerable in the face of extreme weather, changes in climate or more degradation due to human impact. Cities could either contribute to this unnatural selection by planting more and more of the same charismatic plant species, I'm looking at you, Japanese cherry blossom, or they could become living seed banks where a vast diversity of native and appropriate plants are cherished, whether they appeal to our modern aesthetic sensibilities or not. And I'm thinking of places like Kew Gardens here in London, which uh, literally is a, a, a kind of safe, <laughs> safe place and a reservoir for m- many kinds of different plant species that are protected there. Uh, and so if they go extinct in the wild, there will still be specimens that exist in places like Kew Gardens that are protected. And that means there's possibility that they could be rewilded and reintroduced again. Another interesting example is uh, the ginkgo tree, which is native to China, but because of uh, land use change um, and the destruction of natural habitats has essentially become extinct in the wild or is almost extinct in the wild. But in fact, you find these trees, ginkgo trees, all over cities on the east coast of the USA. Uh, They were brought over by settlers hundreds of years ago, and they absolutely thrive in that climate, apparently. Um, And so it means that although they're not really native, um, they seem to be predisposed to do well in that environment. They're thriving. And it means if there's ever a push, which I hope there is, to reintroduce the ginkgo tree to, to its native habitat in China there's plenty of seeds and specimens available that are just being kept (laughs) on the streets of New York, basically. I want to go one level deeper now and propose a third approach, which calls back to the definition of the word biophilia. Biophilia means the love of living things. The emotionally mature among you, I'm sure, would agree that when you love someone or something, you don't just use them for your own benefit, as we do with urban greening or nature-based solutions. You also care about their well-being. So a truly biophilic approach would mean treating urban ecosystems with the same care and generosity as rural nature reserves, conservation sites and national parks. I'm reminded of um, a fantastic concept that I learned from the Donut Economics Action Lab, which is applying donut economics to the city level. And they ask a number of prompts when they're going through this process. And so, for instance, you can read how Amsterdam has created um, a local donut for Amsterdam and and an action plan based on that. And one of the things they ask is, how can this city be as generous as the surrounding wild land? So the idea is that we would look at the natural habitat, the intact ecosystems that are around the city. uh, And I, I guess if they're not there, maybe we need to... Uh, do some historical research and consider what would have been the wild land around a city. And then we think about in the design, the urban planning of the urban space, we think about how can it be as generous as that wild land. The word generous here is really interesting because nature is inherently generous. We get loads of free stuff from nature. We get fresh air, we get pure water, and we get all of our food, all of our medicine originally comes from from nature but also consider the fact that we we need to as i said earlier break down this dualism of thinking that nature is out there and we're in here in our own place if we're also a part of nature we also need to be generous back to it as well and i think that's maybe a moral encompassing um it's very conceptual i know but we can start to think about some ways that that actually uh, can be applied in real life one thing we might think about is the National Park City movement that is really being spread all around the world. I've talked about this on the podcast. I'm a volunteer ranger with London National Park City. London was the first city in the world to get the title of a National Park City uh, back in 2019. 
uh, and basically came off the back of a huge citizen grassroots movement to get people connecting to nature, thinking about the nature that's in the city, the biodiversity that's in the city, celebrating it uh, and making the most of it, and ultimately asking the question, if we, if London was a national park and we thought about it as a national park, how would that change our relationship with nature? Lots and lots of people are, are engaged in this movement. Um, it's very difficult to tell you what is the end goal um, or even what direction we're pointing in because it's so grassroots led uh, and it's so it's such a broad church. So, for instance, we have 150 volunteer rangers um, as part of London National Park City. And it's made up of people like me, older people who are, for instance, uh, ecologists, people who are artists, musicians, people who are educators, who run forest schools, loads and loads of different kinds of people. They all do their own version of engaging with the National Park City and pushing forward the idea that we can make London greener, healthier and wilder. So although I can't tell you, what, in a sense, what success would look like, it's up to all of us to engage with our local nature in the city and think about how we can better connect to it, how we can help other people connect to it, and how we can ultimately make the city a more biophilic place. And I think that's a really beautiful um, idea because, again, it comes out to that thing of this has to be locally specific, it has to be reflective of how local people actually engage with nature, uh, what, it, what is important to them, and then enabling them to get involved and have a stake and actually change their place for the better. Should say as well, the second national park city officially is Adelaide in Australia. And there's lots and lots of more cities who have their own campaigns all across the world who are looking to do this. So this is a movement that will only grow. And I'm really excited to see what it means for cities and how it changes them for the better in the coming years. The final thing I want to talk about, bringing it back to the topic of this whole series, is evolution. I mentioned earlier that humans have not evolved significantly to deal with the urban environment, but it seems that this isn't true for all species. In the book Darwin Comes to Town, Dutch biologist Menno Schultheisen, probably not pronouncing that right, apologies, Menno Schultheisen argues that cities should be thought of as not one ecosystem, but as an archipelago of island ecosystems. Your local public park is a distinct ecosystem, which is different to another park 10 miles away, or the vegetation along the railway tracks, or your neighbour's back garden. Each of these different micro-ecosystems contain species that are either lucky enough to be pre-adapted to them, such as pigeons who happily perch on buildings because they evolved to perch on rocks and cliff edges, or species that have literally evolved within the, eco within the urban environment. A famous example is the London underground mosquito, which is a distinct species of mosquito with unique genetics and behaviour which is only found within London's underground tunnels. There are also more subtle examples. Researchers in Nebraska found that over a period of only 30 years, the anatomy of a particular colony of cliff swallows changed. These birds, which usually nest in cliff faces, began nesting instead in, a new, in newly built concrete highway bridges. This meant that they were coming into contact with a lot more motor vehicles, and unfortunately many were killed when they couldn't take off from the ground fast enough to escape speeding vehicles. It turns out that having a shorter wing means that you can take off quicker, and so evolutionary pr pressure started to reward the swallows who had slightly shorter wings. Schiltheisen writes, The conclusion was inescapable. Only cliff swallows with wings short enough to take off vertically from the tarmac to escape an oncoming car had managed to get away and spread their short wing genes in the gene pool. The tardier long-winged ones ended up as ex-swallows on the hard shoulder, their long wing genes excluded from the gene pool, and as the surviving swallows became even better adapted at evading approaching vehicles, the numbers of casualties plummeted. The author makes the argument that cities should be considered as their own novel ecosystems, or in fact a series of novel island ecosystems carved up by paved surfaces and roads. <laughs>
Many species cannot survive in cities. And yet they also create unique homes for many others, including lots of exotic species. Because of human activities, there are pockets of ecosystems that are very challenging and can only be populated by particular well-adapted plants and animals. For instance, in northern latitudes, with cold winters, we cover our streets in salt to melt the ice and make them safer for travelling on. But all this salt has to go somewhere. It gets washed away into surrounding soil, giving roadside green spaces a much different, saltier chemistry. Because of that, only a particular subset of species will thrive in these conditions. You can see how this gets incredibly complex. Our initial reaction may be to lament the destruction that humans have caused and to feel, like many environmentalists do, that the world would be better off without humans in it. Schultheisen acknowledges this, writing, It's time to own up to the fact that human actions are the world's single most influential ecological force. Whether we like it or not, we have become fully integrated with everything that goes on on this planet. Only in our flights of fancy can we still keep nature divorced from the human environment. However, he takes a more positive look at this and stresses our interconnectedness with natural systems, writing, When talking about nature, why do we always implicitly or explicitly factor humans out of the equation? Why consider that ant nest hanging in that tree over there as natural, but our human cities not? Why do we admire the leading part that these ants play in the ecological workings of their bit of rainforest, but at the same time do we express disgust at the way humans may dominate a landscape? There is no essential difference. He goes on to say, I consider human cities as a fully natural phenomenon, on a par with the megastructures that other ecosystem engineers build for their societies. The only difference being that whereas ants, termites, corals and beavers have been maintaining their roles at a stably modest level for millions of years, the scale of human ecosystem engineering has grown by several orders of magnitude over just a few thousand years. Schiltheisen puts forward some ideas for how urban designers can consider evolution in our work. What he calls Guidelines for Building with Darwin, Four Rules for Evolutionarily Informed Urban Nature Planning. Number one, let it grow. Now there's a real art and a science to really good landscape design um, and I really a- appreciate beautiful um, landscapes and the kind of choices of plants and flowers that get put into these kind of places that are just absolutely beautiful. But Schiltheisen argues that this is actually working against urban uh, evolution. He writes, while the handpicking of such elite troops is understandable, It totally ignores the motley crews of urban plants that these new green spaces are parachuted into. Everywhere in the city, in gutters, roadsides, and on non-designed rooftops, communities of plants are co-evolving with each other, with the microorganisms in the soil and the air, with the insects and other invertebrates that eat and pollinate them, and with the urban environment, the heat island, the patchiness of the soil, the heavy metal pollution, and so on. These evolutionary processes are not helped by dropping a foreign body of pre-assembled plant species among them. Much better would be to let the green spaces assemble naturally from species growing abundantly elsewhere in the city. This would entail not planting anything, perhaps not even adding soil, but simply leaving the beds empty and letting their urban ecosystem colonise it under its own steam. Now this is an approach that is so contrary to, to what we you know, best practice best practice and in particular I think a huge barrier to this even if in the long term it ends up with a more biodiverse and a more um, well-fitted assemblage of species Uh, it means that when you finish your development um, or your new landscape design it just it looks totally empty and bare (laughs) and you know that's not really going to attract people to buy the house or to rent the office um, or it's actually to use the space, the public space, in the, you know, when it first opens. So even though from a biologist's point of view, this might be better, I can see this being incredibly difficult to actually pull off. But I think it's worth um, worth considering on small scales. Also for the fact that it's like the option of least resistance. So if you just had some land and you didn't want to spend any money on it, maybe just leave it bare for a couple of years and see what happens. You might end up with a really interesting ecosystem there. <laughs> 
Rule number two, not necessarily native. Now, earlier in this episode and in previous episodes, uh, I, me and other guests have talked about how important it is to plant native plants, native species within our places and how they are best adapted to be here uh, and they interact the most with other kinds of insects and animals and other kinds of plants. Schiltheisen goes the other direction and he says that actually because um, urban ecosystems are so different to the surrounding countryside or a, a, a natural wild place, native species may not even be the best adapted for the urban ecosystem. He writes, of course it sounds cosy to plant native flora in the city, but we have to face the fact that many of the species that have been evolving and adapting to the urban environment most successfully are not native. It is those ecological super tramps, those citizens of the world, that will make up the bulk of that globalised urban ecosystem, and urban planners could do worse than yield to that inconvenient truth of urban evolution. This is one that I find difficult to get on board with, but I'm, you know, this is someone who has studied this to a much greater degree than anything I have, and so I find a really interesting perspective to come from him, something else to throw in to our continuing understanding of, of urban ecology. Rule number three, he calls pristine pockets, and in a sense is slightly contrary to rule number two, where he says that if there is um, pristine pockets of original non-urban habitat inside the city, those need to be protected. Do not lose those. And so he uses the example of in Singapore, there's only a few uh, parks that contain the old growth old growth forest that would have been there before the city um, was built. I'm also thinking uh, about Helsinki, which is famous for its uh, green fingers of forest, old growth forest that reaches right into the city centre. It's really important that those intact ecosystems are kept and not lost. Rule number four, final rule, is called splendid isolation. The author writes, One of the central tenets in urban green design these days is corridors, creating linear strips of vegetation or greenways between parks and other fragments of vegetation in the city. To make an interconnected network of urban green space is all the rage. It seems like a good idea. After all, it is the urban equivalent of what has been standard practice in nature conservation outside the city for many decades. When a species disappears from one fragment, it could recolonize from another. This way, the food webs in all those networked reserves stay intact. Whether corridors are a good thing in the evolving urban ecosystem is another matter. Think of those white-footed mice in New York, each clan adapted to the specific demands of the park that it found itself isolated in. To them, it may actually be a good thing to be trapped in their own park and not to be blended all the time with poorly adapted mice from other parks. The same may be true for other smaller animals and plants that are trapped in the smallest of urban pocket parks. Like those mice, they probably evolved to adapt to the idiosyncrasies of their particular corner of the city. Connecting those corners via corridors will link those populations and break down those delicate adaptations. So for the evolution of much of urban life, it might be wise to think twice before planning a corridor. This is another point which is totally in opposition to what is considered best practice in in urban ecology and urban landscape design. And this is another one that will take a while for me to sort of get my head around. He may not be right, he may be right in certain circumstances, but I guess we don't really know until we maybe do some more research, do some more experimentation with these things. It's certainly a different and fresh perspective um, that we can start to consider, and I think is representative of just how complex thinking about urban ecology is. As I'm wrapping up here, I just want to bring it back to our relationship with all of these aspects of nature, whether they're in the city or outside. It's worth putting this into perspective by looking at how we historically coexisted with nature before agriculture. Although we often talk about a harsh break between a foraging lifestyle and agriculture, in reality the process was much more gradual. There was a long period in between those two extremes in which humans did alter their environments for their benefit, but in a way that also served the wider ecosystem. 
This is sometimes referred to as stewardship or custodialism and may point towards a sustainable relationship with nature that we could reignite in the future. In the book Braiding Sweetgrass, Robin Wall Kimmerer describes how certain plant species co-evolved with humans and require humans interacting and altering the landscape to flourish. For example, Native American groups, such as the author's own Potawatomi tribe, would harvest wild sweetgrass to make baskets. They would follow the principle of the honourable harvest and never forage more than half of what they found. This allowed the sweetgrass to regenerate rather than being constantly depleted. However, recent scientific study by Walt Kimmerer and a student of hers reveals that when wild sweetgrass is left unharvested, its numbers actually decline. The plant needs humans to play their part in the ecosystem to thin its numbers and to stimulate new growth to come through. Michael Pollan and Sarah Ichioka also talk about this concept in their book Flourish. They write, The concept of stewardship or guardianship reveals the important possibility of humans neither being subsumed into nature nor being completely separate, but instead being able to participate as part of nature. For the avoidance of doubt, we are not advocating a return to a pre-agrarian civilization. Instead, we are interested in how human cultures, and in particular designers, can shift our patterns of thinking so that we become active participants in the web of natural systems. The potential exists for humans to reach a state of co-evolution as nature in which the connectivities of humans and living systems are jointly served. I'm going to leave it there for this episode biophilia, ecology, all of this is such a huge, huge topic. I feel like I've only scratched the surface here, but hopefully I've given you a couple of interesting ideas um, to consider and to, to follow through with. All of the sources for everything I've talked about here are in the podcast description. There's loads of great books that I reference, which I really um, recommend that you get a copy of, um, get copies of and read more if any of this has piqued your interest. Thank you so much for listening and I'll be back again with more episodes very soon.